reference to a specific question? This, no. This guy. Okay, so ask, keep, keep asking your question because I don't, I want to, I want to be real focused on what we talk about. I'm just confused on how you find the mole Well, so I'm going to answer that question really generically and honestly I haven't even read question 67. Um, but, but if, if we, if we draw, if we draw our happy little picture, right? And so if we've got a container, and if that container, why does that not work? Um, here, let's just go X's and O's. So if we've got a gas that is X's, that's an O, and an O. So if we have a gas that's X's and O's, in order to find the mole fraction, let's say each squiggle is a, is a mole, we need to know the total number of moles, and hopefully I did that right, and it's 10. And then if we want to know the mole fraction of X's, there are four, so the mole fraction would be two-fifths. Okay. It's really that straightforward. I think, though, given what I saw John write in, in his answer, Okay, so let, let's talk about that. So honing in on maybe <clears throat> what John was talking about here, um, we th this is important, and and so maybe we should talk about about this bit. So we taught when we were talking about mole fractions, we had our reds and our blues, right? And if you remember, I think we wrote number of moles above and we wrote pressures down below and we found out that the mole ratios were the pressure ratios. Um, and vice versa. So the big idea is this. If we have a sample of gas and if we know the percentage of it by mole that is present, that's also the percentage that it is contributing to the total pressure and vice versa. If you know the percentage of a pressure of a gas that's caused by some component of it, you also know its mole fraction. And that's what this is about. So um, this fraction of moles is equal to this mole, this fraction by, by even volume and pressure. So volume works too. So these, these fractions are all the same. Um, we could go back through Pivnert and solve for that. That would make Clara excited because it's deriving equations, but let's don't. Is that okay? Yeah. So, John, did you want to go to 71? Or 70 whatever? I don't, I don't mean to be leading the conversation somewhere it doesn't need to go, but guys, let's just open it up. What else? You want to look at it? Well, it, it should be there. Um, is this the one about diving gases? Oh, okay. So, the, so you said you were confused that X was on that side. Yeah, when you start off with like the oxygen, you total. Well, so let's do this. And I, I, I like that you're thinking about the ideas rather than blindly writing down the math. But if we look at the AP equation sheet, this is the form in which it's given. So, let, but let's talk about the logic. So, John, what this is saying is that if we have a mixture of gases, and if if we have a mixture of gases, and if we are interested in looking at one component of that gas, for example, oxygen, if we know the total pressure of the gas. And if we know, here I'm going to rewrite this. So pressure of O2 is equal to the mole fraction of O2. And that would be moles of O2 divided by moles total. And then if we've got the pressure total, we understand that our mole ratios are equivalent to our pressure ratios. So if we know the total pressure, and if we know the fraction of the, of the moles that is relative to the oxygen, which is the one we care about, we also know that pressure ratio is the same. And we can make this a fraction of the total pressure, giving us the pressure of our component gas. Is that okay?
Is that good? I like that you're trying to understand the logic rather than just blindly write down the math, and that's good. 25? Hold on. Oh, wait. Oh, 25 in that question? No, I'm saying number 25. Oh, hold on. So not that 25. I'm so confused. 25? Ah, here? Oh, hold on. Did we skip this? Is this manometers? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I know. All right, 25. Yeah, so guys, these are what are called, open up your book. You need to understand this. Go look at it. So guys, looking at page 416, number 25, these are actually a thing. Um, these are what are called manometers. I had a class several years ago that called them manometers, and they figured that it actually um, would measure just how manly a guy is. Sorry, you didn't appreciate that. This class found it amusing. These are what are called manometers. And so, guys, let's do manometer 101. I forgot that we skipped this. I seriously hate my board. Menomena. All right, so guys, Manometers 101. This is a manometer. Guys, all that a manometer does, and you understand this is the lab you've done and the lab you're about to do. Guys, all a manometer does is allows you to compare relative gas pressures um, by using the displacement of a liquid, whether it's water or whether it's mercury, doesn't matter. Um, guys, this is a manometer. So is a barometer. We talked about the idea that if this is mercury, we measure that height and it gives us the atmospheric pressure um, in millimeters of mercury or tor. So then, guys, what about these pictures that we are seeing in uh, page uh, 1025? And so, guys, you'll notice that the left two are open-ended manometers and then a closed manometer. So you guys know what kind of artist I am, so you're going to have to be really forgiving with me. But here is our cell. That is not bad. Oh, uh, thank you. All right. So, guys, here's what we've got. Over here, we've got a gas. That is one of the things that we are comparing. Now, guys, this is an open manometer, so we've also got a gas over here that we like to call the atmosphere. So, guys, the idea is this. You understand that if these levels are equal, what is the pressure of the gas? The same as the atmosphere, right? Now guys, what if this is lower? Which is more pressure, the gas or the atmosphere? So what you would do is you would actually measure this height and add it, assuming we're at sea level, say that this is 760 or whatever it is off of, off of a barometer. Guys, what we would do, say we're at sea level, we would take 760 millimeters, add this height, and that would give us the pressure of the gas. Does that make sense? Now, what if the tables are turned? I don't know if I can back out of this far enough. I can't. So guys, what if the tables are turned? And what if, sorry, this is going to make a mess, but you get the idea. What if it's this way and this is up here and this is down here? Now, which has the greater pressure? So that what, then what we do is we measure the height and subtract. You get the idea? Okay, now guys, watch this. 
now let's do this and let's put a lid on this thing. Now we have a closed we have a closed manometer. But guys, the idea is this. We draw a vacuum on this side of the tube. There is not air trapped in there. And so then what we do is we just measure this height. And it's in reference to zero because your reference side is actually a vacuum. And so you'll notice that they represent this in the picture. Um, so we've got something like this. But now, guys, the height of the liquid is the, uh, the pressure of the gas because your reference side is not the atmosphere. Your reference side is a vacuum. Does that make sense? There you go. So guys, you will actually see this when you get into college labs. Um, you'll be doing processes where you'll actually be measuring the pressures of gases. And you'll actually, sometimes, it depends on the lab, some professors love for you to actually see things move. You guys understand that's why we use alcohol thermometers and not digital thermometers in lab? Guys, I purposefully don't put digital thermometers in your hands because I want you to have that tactile experience of seeing things go up and down. Some professors will do the same things here just so that you have that experience of seeing them change. So, are we good on that? Oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I guess in theory... So I used, I used to teach this class here 25 years ago. Um, we called it Foundations of Chemistry. I called it Chemistry for Poets. Um, and we would teach it in the summer. And it was basically just kids that could never get through chemistry getting chemistry credit in the summer. And so one of the things we actually did was we tried to make a water-based barometer by dropping a tube off the back of the football stadium. Um, right? And then, just because I thought it was funny, I made them suck the air out of the tube. <laughs> and, I mean, obviously they couldn't get it to 20 feet high. And the problem was, is the tube collapsed. It was thick-walled rubber. It collapsed. And I couldn't do glass. So I don't, I, I don't have first-hand experience with it. But I think that makes sense, that the water would boil before it would reach its potential full height. Yeah, I think that's, a, that, I never thought about that. I think that's true. Yeah, it's a great observation. Are we done with the homework, y'all? Good. All right, let's get this in a little thing we like to call the book. And then, guys, I recorded for you. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So, Elizabeth, give me um, context. Physics general or physics AP? Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I love what you're doing there um, because you... So in physics, you had, you had Leosa, right? So Leosa, and it was so strange. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, in chemistry, we used to spend like two weeks getting really good at dimensional analysis. And I think that that's where you're in sort of a weird spot because you probably remember the idea that if one foot something like this is 12 inches, then one cube squared foot is equal to 144 squared inches. Because you have to, is that kind of what you're referring back to? Yeah, so here's the thing that's here. Let me, let me do this and I think it'll make it better. Um, boom. So I think this is where you're getting confused. Um, so what does PSI mean? And it means pounds per, and per means divided. It means pounds per square inch. So this is not a unit conversion question because you already have pounds and square inches. So you don't have to do 
any of this unit conversion kind of stuff because you've already got the units that you need. So really it's as simple as dividing 130 by 0.5. Those in my mind are the same. It's not even one like half inch on both ways. That would be a cool thing. Yeah. It's like it's like a rectangle. Is that okay? Yeah. That's really interesting. I Yeah. That, I'm glad that you brought that up. John, were you gonna say something? Somebody, I thought somebody else was like, wait a minute, can we talk? Well done. Thanks for looking at chivalry, right? Are you guys, are we all good? Okay, so now let me pause this. And guys, while we're today, um, today is the last day of this unit, which means um, Monday we're looking at the test. But guys, I know right now, maybe you're thinking in your head, wait, we haven't got the previous test back yet to rewrite. Because that's on purpose. Um, let me explain to you why. So, and maybe it's been so long ago you don't remember. Do you remember what was on the previous test? Let me say it differently. Do you remember that the last test that you took, and you're right, but guys, the last test that you took, we were cherry picking. Do you know, you know where it was? Draw the Lewis dot structure, and then this, and then this, but don't do D and E right? Because D and E were all about intermolecular forces and they were about solubility. And so guys, the previous test was the strong precursor to what we're doing now. So guys, what I do is I have you rewrite both these tests at the same time and that gives you the complete flow. Because what you'll do is you'll rewrite the previous test first and then you get to have, and did you know, I gave you all the questions, right? I didn't protect you or hide from you D and E. I just had you not do them. And so what you can do during the test, it's not part of the rewrite, but you can actually now glance at D and E and go, oh, given what I know now, I now see where that question was headed. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. No, 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 no. And thank you. That was actually going through my head. So the test that you're going to take on Monday is not D and E. The question that you'll take, the questions on, on um, Monday's test will be new questions where you actually get to go full circle with them. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last time's test was about, about Lewis dot structures. It was about molecular geometries. It was about all of that stuff. But the stuff that I protected you from was the so what. It was, um, so why does this boil at a temperature higher than this? Why is this? Why does this have a higher boiling point, but it doesn't dissolve in water? Ooh. You're going to see that on the test on Monday. Yeah. So, guys, can we talk about it? Why does oil have a really high boiling point, but it doesn't dissolve in water? Just let that chew for a minute. Why does oil have a really high boiling point, but it doesn't dissolve in water? So, guys, is this, just again, I want to frame the question. Is this a within question? or an in-between question? It's both. So let's do the first part first. Why does oil have a really high boiling point? Is that within or in-between? That's within. What's the answer? Really polarizable. Guys, you want to use the words induced dipoles, big, polarizable, strong induced dipoles. But then the next question is, why does it not dissolve in water? Is this an in-between or a within? It's an in-between. And that's all you got to say. It's non-polar. Therefore, water doesn't have anywhere to, to solvate it, to grab a hold of it. And therefore, it doesn't dissolve. 
Those are the kinds of things. So Elijah, to your thought, that's that's then the thing you're. So you're going to see the beginning of it. Hey, here's a water molecule. Is it that's what? But then it goes full circle to why doesn't this dissolve in water? Why does this have a high boiling point? Yeah. What was that thing that you said we're going to forget again? I forget. No, straight up, I do forget. No. Was that it? No, because you don't get to say that out loud. I don't remember. <laughs> Shoot. But let's just assume when you get to the test, you won't forget. All right, tell you what, remind me at the end of the day and I will scan through the test and see if it jumps out at me. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, but, but also understand we were picking bits out of all of those chapters. So to efficiently study for this, you don't want to do all of it. Let your notes be the guide. But guys, please this. Um, I know that the last three days have been about gases, right? And that's definitely a part of this test. But guys, don't forget polarities. Don't forget IMFs. Don't forget the withins and the in-betweens. Don't forget solubility. Don't forget vapor pressure. Don't forget that stuff. Because I know that your mind is most directly attracted to the last thing you did. But guys, this is not the most important part of the unit. The most important part, again, the part that's the hardest on the AP test is not gases. It's intermolecular forces and things like solubility and boiling point. That's where you really want to spend your time. Don't forget gases, but don't, don't spend too much time. All right, so guys, you ready? Look, gases. I know. So guys, it's time to clear up one of the many lies that I shared with you last year. This is, this is at some level going to be worth, I would say don't write it down in the picture. I would suggest maybe you jot some of these ideas down in the note space. So guys, here we have two samples of gases. In the note space, please write down all of the things that these two gases have in common. All of the things these two gases have in common. And then maybe you could write down the things that make them different. And if you write down color, I'm going to kick you. That a girl. Good job, Neela. That is a wonderful answer. We're all so proud of you. Remember, guys, everyone gets a trophy, right? What? Ooh. Yes. Then. I think what you guys should do on the AP test is figure out a way to get PES into every question you answer. Actually, what you should do is find, find a way on the AP test to bring in the salt dissolving in water video or the can of compressed air. I know this from when I watched this video. Like, that's right. All right. That's right. There you go. All right, so guys, you 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 are you are going to not like this. Yeah, so but but now you know enough to know. So guys, if you would allow me, we're gonna say the volumes are the same. We know that gases are three-dimensional and the circles are the same size. Then guys, we're also going to say that the number of moles are the same because we've been allowing dots to represent moles. Then guys, we are going to say that the temperatures are the same because we're gonna say they're, they're both room temperature. Is that okay? 
Okay. Now I've got questions for you. Are the densities the same? Why not? They're different types of uh, particles. Guys, helium weighs about 2. Neon weighs about 20. So guys, which gas is more dense? The neon, because the particles themselves are more massive. Now guys, this is the one that you're not going to like. What does temperature actually measure about a substance? The speed of the molecules, right? The faster they move, the greater their temperature. You heat them up, they move faster. We learned that last year, right? Well, guys, here's the deal. The speed of the helium particles and the speed of the neon particles are not the same. Density, we've established, is not the same, but their speeds are not the same. But guys, you got to understand, some of you actually said the correct answer out loud, and I tried to ignore it. Because I know that, that from what you learned last year, guys, we just said that a thermometer is a molecular speed meter, and so the faster the molecules move, the higher their temperature, right? So if you've got two gases at the same temperature, they should be moving the same speed. That's what you learned last year. That's wrong. Michael, you said what's right. What is actually the same if their temperatures are the same? <laughs> Guys, their kinetic energies are the same. And that's different. Guys, why is it different? Here's why. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. And one-half m v squared. That's velocity, speed. Yeah, sorry, physics. Thank you. Um, so guys, it's one half m v squared. So in ye last year, you learned that if the temperatures are the same, the velocities are the same. But guys, this is not true. If the temperatures are the same, the kinetic energies are the same. But why are their velocities not the same? Different masses. So guys, here's the deal. Helium has a lower mass. Neon has a higher mass. As a result, in order for their kinetic energies to be the same, which particles, helium or neon, have to be moving faster in order for their kinetic energies to be equal? Helium. So guys, the deal is this. At the same temperature, lighter particles move faster. Do you understand it logically, visually, and maybe based on the math? But guys, the bottom line is that. At, simil at, at same similar temperatures, lighter particles are moving faster. So now let's all cheat like Michael did. Big cheater pants. Guys, that's all of this. So I think if you were really following along on the previous slide, you may not need, well, it's already there. But you should be able to agree with this. If you've got two dissimilar gases, helium and neon, Guys, the idea is that at the same temperature, their kinetic energies are the same. Their speeds are not the same. The reason is because their masses are different. And the take-home message then is that um, at equal temperatures, lighter gases are traveling faster. Good? Can we move on? So then, guys, the question becomes, so what? And, guys, these are the so what's. E-fusion and D-fusion. So guys, what's the difference? Frankly, when you get into college, very few people actually draw a distinction between the two. Um, guys, we used to have to look at this mathematically. 
um, because you can actually figure out the molecular mass of a gas by comparing how fast it effuses compared to another gas. But guys, really at the end of the day, for all intents and purposes, effusion and defusion can be used interchangeably. Technically, the difference is this. If you've got a container and if there is a gas inside of this, guys, if you blow a hole in the side of the container, those gas particles are going to leave, right? Do you have to, little AP review, right? We're going to do this. Guys, do we have to squeeze the container to get the gas particles to leave? So is it spontaneous? Is it reversible? No. Those guys, those gas particles are not magically all going to go back inside the container. And now you're thinking, wait a minute, gosh, this sounds familiar. Uh-oh. So guys, you're thinking this sounds familiar. Guys, remember this game that we played when we learned about spontaneity? And we said if you've got one atmosphere of gas over here and zero atmospheres of gas over here, and if you open up the valve, what are you going to end up with? You're going to get half an atmosphere over here and half an atmosphere over here. And you don't have to do anything to make that happen because the molecules do it spontaneously because of what driving force? Entropy, huh? A little review of, of chapter 19. Um, guys, when we talked about this all those months ago, what we were actually talking about is the process of effusion. This is a gas escaping through a hole. Guys, understand that that is not this. This... If we go like this and let the gas out, that's not a fusion. Why not? The elasticity of the balloon is forcing the gas out. Guys, a fusion happens a lot more slowly because it's not driven by compression. It's driven by entropy. So it happens more slowly. So, guys, then what about diffusion? So, guys, diffusion, I mean, the example that chemistry teachers always use is they put a little bit of vanilla inside of a balloon and then they blow up the balloon and they tie it off and oh shoot they tie it off and then very quickly you can smell the vanilla because the vanilla actually can go through the pores in the balloon and then it spreads out in the room. Um, guys, that's actually diffusion. I always thought vanilla was a stupid example, so let's just be real about this. Guys, if you fart in a public space, diffusion is your enemy. Seriously, you're thinking to yourself, please don't diffuse, please don't diffuse, please don't diffuse, because that's why the stink smells that fills up the room. Guys, these molecules are moving randomly, and some of them are moving in, but when they move in, they move past each other, and when they move out, they move out. And so, guys, just because of entropy, the net movement of a gas that you, so like if you go, and you breathe into the room. Guys, you can do the math, it's complicated, but you can figure out how quickly your breath fills the room equally. Um, and so that is diffusion spreading out throughout another gas. So there you go. Thoughts? Sorry, I'm having a hard time getting past farting. Um, so, you guys okay? You go ahead. That's a great question and the answer is yes. Guys, please. So we said we sort of use them interchangeably, but they both are a function of the mass of the gas. So guys, ready? Thank you for bringing us back. You should be able to answer this question. Helium or neon, which one will effuse more quickly? Helium. They're moving faster. And by the way, guys, why does effusion happen at all? Remember, these molecules are bouncing all over the place and hitting the wall. And every now and then, they'll hit the place where there isn't a wall. And they go through. So the faster they're moving, the faster they effuse. And then also, the faster they defuse. Um, so I guess if you're going to toot, make sure your toot molecules are heavy. That got gross. Never mind. All right. So, guys, are you good there? You doing okay? <laughs> Sorry. 
So now what we need to do is figure out the molecular mass of toot gas. Let's not do that. <laughs> all right. So guys, this is what, <laughs> sorry. That was all my fault. Some of you have been asking what we're going to do after the AP test. That could be, stop it. All right. So guys, this is, this is the end of this unit. So guys, when you hear the word theory, you think it's different than a law, right? Laws are proven, theories are still being tested. Guys, in the same way that we have Avogadro's principle, which makes it sound like it's not really for sure. Guys, when we say theory, what we mean is a way to think about things. And so on the AP test, guys, um, think about everything that you've learned about gases. You've learned about Boyle's law. You've learned about Charles' law. You've learned about ideal gases. You've learned the importance of the words ineffective and insignificant. Those are the words you want to use. And guys, please, when you say that this gas is ideal um, because it's small, please do not say this. Do not say this gas is ideal because the volume is insignificant. It's the volume of the particles compared to the volume of the gas. You've got to say it's the volume of the particles that are insignificant, not the volume of the gas. But guys, all of these things that you've learned, density, ideal gases, Charles Boyle, all of this stuff, guys, on the AP test, they are going to ask that you explain all of these things through what is called kinetic molecular theory. And so it's literally kinetic energy, right? Movement. It's the theory of moving molecules. And guys, I think you're going to look at this and you're going to go, yeah, get it. So guys, these are the basic assumptions. And then we're going to talk about what we're going to do with this. So the basic assumption is this. Gases have got lots of little things moving fast. And this, the volume of the gas molecules, hey, do you want to underline insignificant so you remember that's a word you're going to use on the test? The volume of the gas molecules is insignificant compared to the volume of the gas. And then finally, guys, the gas molecules don't exhibit intermolecular forces. They are ineffective. But guys, fundamentally, what we've just done is we've described ideal gases. Then, guys, we need to do this. You guys all caught up with me? You okay? Okay, so going back to slide number two, you don't need to do that. Guys, this is the way that we look at gases. But here's the problem. This is a picture. Turn it into a video. What's going on inside your heads? What are these particles doing? They're doing everything they can to travel in straight lines. What keeps that from happening? They run into each other or they run into the wall. And when they run into the wall, what does that create? Pressure. See how this all ties together? And so, guys, we understand as we think about this theory of moving molecules that these are all ideal gases. But then, guys, this, and if you've taken physics... You'll never see this on the test. But, guys, when these molecules run into each other, we consider these collisions to be elastic. Do you guys know what that means? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's going to forever be... No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, guys, that's really it. 
You learn this in physics. There are elastic. You'll never see this on the AP test, but you're going to have teachers, professors that will get into this with you. Um, and guys, the problem is, is if you've taken, if you're taking chemistry in college, but you haven't taken physics, they're going to assume that you know the difference. It's a quick Google search, but let me explain it to you now. Guys, when two things collide, there's two ways that that can happen elastically or inelastically. So guys, imagine this, watch my hands. Imagine that you've got a ball that's moving in this direction and then you've Im imagine you've got another ball that's catching up to it more quickly. Can I do this? Seriously, I have no idea if I'm this coordinated. So here's this ball moving slow, here's this ball moving fast, and when they run into each other, that was good. The energy transfers from fastball to slow ball. Why? Well, this has got more kinetic energy. It's moving faster. And so when it hits, it accelerates this ball. It goes faster. What does this one do? Slows down. But guys, in an elastic collision, energy is conserved. All the energy that is lost by the faster ball is gained by the slower ball, and the net change is no loss in energy. In an elastic collision, that's not the case. When fast hits slow, slow speeds or slow speeds up and fast slows, slows down, yeah. Um, but some of the energy is lost, typically in the form of heat. So, guys, when we think of gases as being ideal, we just need to understand that they, when they collide, the assumption is they're not losing, losing temper, they're not losing energy. Understand, guys, that this works for gases because if we have a balloon full of gas, actually the collisions are ela are inelastic. They're losing energy, but that energy is replaced by the room. Anyway. You'll see it more when you get into college. But moving on from there, guys, the idea is that when these things collide, the average kinetic energy doesn't change so long as we can replace that little bit of energy. So you're going, wait, we had fast and slow, and slow sped up and fast slowed down. Yeah, but if you could look at the average of fast and slow, the average of their speeds would be the same on either side of the collision because fast sped up as much as, sorry, slow sped up as much as fast slow. You know what I'm saying, right? So many words. All right. And then, guys, finally this, these things. And again, yeah, right, we already talked about this. Kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. The hotter they are, um, they do move faster, but it's really a function of the kinetic energy going up. So temperature actually measures kinetic energy. Good there? Okay. So, guys, this then, relative to that, this then is what you've got to be able to do. You need to be able to take all the things that are floating around in your brain about ideal gases, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Pivner, all of that stuff. And guys, again, remember what we said. Equations don't make things happen. Equations describe what's happening. So you have got to be able to describe what is happening through this understanding. Gases are large collections of small things moving around. That's the lens that you've got to be able to do this kind of work with. So guys, it's in the slides. So if you have a gas and its volume goes up and its temperature doesn't change, Explain at a molecular level what is happening to pressure. And guys, I want you to do this. Does this answer, and again, guys, we're reviewing for the AP test all the time now, right? But guys, you understand this. Have we talked about this? Passing the AP test has a little bit to do with how much chemistry you know. It has a lot to do with knowing how to answer questions. So let's talk about this. A, volu a volume, I'm sorry, so there would be a stem to this. So at, and they would go like this. Explain at a molecular level 
what happens when volume increases at constant, I'm sorry, explain what happens to pressure when volume increases at constant temperature. But guys, you gotta be able to do it at a molecular level. So this is not a list, this is sentences. So how are you going to start? Restate the question. So at constant pressure, an increase in volume will make the pressure go period, and then explain it using kinetic molecular theory. Guys, you should be able to do this in three sentences. Go. So it's sort of a risk-reward kind of thing, right? So the risk of using abbreviations is it makes you look lazy. You know what I'm saying? The reward is it buys you time. So, and, and I know this shouldn't be the case, but the more engaged you appear as you're writing, the more of the benefit of the doubt you're going to get. Um, certainly, if it's an equation, put T, but I would spend the extra fraction of a second to write it out. Yeah, I like what you're thinking. Mike, I love that you're thinking about that, though, because you're going, hey, what strategies am I going to employ on the test? I would write it out. Yeah. This is actually where things get real. Well, here, I'll let you finish your question, and then we'll talk. And guys, we understand the follow-up question is why. You should be done. You got about 10 more seconds. You ready? So guys, let's talk. So again, our problem solving strategy. And guys, if you're not done writing, again, you should be. You need to learn to write well, quickly. So let's talk. And guys, again, this is why we're developing patterns so we don't have to think about how we're going to talk. So we would start the sentence by saying something like this. At constant temperature, an increase in volume would make the pressure go down, period. Now, guys, here's the deal. If you put up, the graders will stop grading the question. I don't know if you know this, when the AP graders grade AP tests, um, each one of the questions is usually, well, if it's a short question, it's worth five, typically. If it's a long question, it's worth nine. And here's what they're trained to do. What they do is when they get your test and they're grading this question, they rock their hand back like this. And then as they're reading your answer, the first thing they're looking for is the answer. At constant temperature, an increase in volume causes the pressure to go down. If you wrote that, the finger has not yet dropped because the follow-up will be explained. So guys, the deal is this. If you said pressure goes up, the finger never drops and they read on. You are truly guilty until proven innocent. Then, if you get the answer right, they continue to look at your explanation. If that is right, the finger drops, you just got a point, and they go on to part B. 
if you don't have your explanation right, the finger never drops. There's no partial credit, and they just go on to B. So in order to get the finger drop, you've got to get the question right and the explanation correct. It's a horrible process. And then at the end of it, they just count how many fingers are on the paper or on the desk. And obviously, if it's worth nine and you got more than five, they just know to add five. And that's your score on the question. It's literally finger falls. Um, anyway, so guys, the question, the answer then is this. Constant temperature, pressure, or volume goes up, pressure goes down. You got to get that part right. But then you got to get this part right. Kinetic molecular theory. Guys, why? And so, seriously, when you get into these gas questions, I would encourage you to close your eyes and watch the video. Let these things dance around in your head. And then think to yourself, okay, what is changing and what isn't? So guys, we know the temperature is not changing. So what is not changing about these molecules? Our speed. So in your brain video, the molecules are going to be moving the same speed, but, oh shoot, oh, I can't do that. I've gotta be in, in out of presentation mode, I forgot. All right, so go here and then escape. Um, but guys, in prison, in, uh, in here, what is that? What is that? Is that a... <laughs> I have no idea what that is. So let's pretend that's not there. Oh, wait, do you have a... Oh, shoot, it was actually something on my screen. Never mind. I had a, I had a, big, I had a big gray dot right there. It was something on my screen. Never mind. All right, so guys, these are not moving faster, but when the volume goes up, they go like this. Why does that make pressure go down? they collide less frequently given any area of the container. So guys, we would then say this, answering the question, at constant temperature, it's always good to establish your constants first. At constant temperature, an increase in volume causes the pressure to go down, period. This is true because the larger volume increases the surface area of the vessel um, and with, how would we say it, um, there would be less collisions per surface area and so the pressure goes down. Yeah, and so the thing that's interesting about this, Claire, and we don't have to do this anymore, um, Pivner hinges on that, but it turns out that, in fact, the collisions between these particles actually do affect the pressure, because what really happens is, is when these particles collide, momentarily they stick, right, and they slow down. And when they slow down, they then, I mean, they, they, there is a slight loss of energy. And that loss of energy causes them to impact the container walls less, with less force, and it does decrease the pressure. Um, so really the way that this plays out is in fact, these things do have intermolecular forces. And it draws the gas away from the sides of the vessel and it actually decreases the pressure. So there's a version of Pivner that actually allows you to quantify the, um, the strength of the IMFs, even at distance, that brings them together. And it's interesting, we measure the strength of intermolecular forces in pressure units. Yeah, it's weird. Go ahead. Uh, so is that just why I like high pressure? Yeah. How do you know that? <laughs> because you're right. Um, I, I love that you know that. Let me show you. Um, look at page. Um, look at page four oh nine. So if you look on page four oh nine, um, what what they've done here is instead of showing that R changes they've actually solved Pivnert for number of moles, which is understood to not change, right? So long as that gas is not leaking, 
um, that should be the same. And then what they do, looking at the graph on 209, is they increase the pressure. And what you find is that the number of moles, um, the gas no longer behaves as if it's one mole. Um, initially, as you increase pressure, it behaves like it's less than a mole. But as you continue to increase pressure, all of a sudden it behaves like it's more than a mole. Um, and so what, what's actually happening, this graph doesn't directly relate to it, is that what's happening is that there, yeah, the, the R value is in fact changing. Um, and so the easiest way to measure that is by increasing pressure and tracking the behavior of the gas relative to the number of moles that it's behaving like. Um, but really what, you're right, that really what's happening is that as, if you think about the equation, you've got, is it PV, yeah, PV over RT, pressure is changing, but so is the value of R. Yeah, so you're, you don't need to know that, but that's actually absolutely true. Yeah, it's cool you knew that. What was the video you watched? Just a second. Uh, it's just like a trash course on video gases. Hmm. But also they use a different R value than you do. They probably use 8.13. Yeah. yeah, the reason is because they're measuring their pressures in kilopascals. Yeah, that's what yeah, yeah, and that's what's going on. Um, if I may, and guys, this is for, and some of the crash course videos on chemistry are decent, but some of them, you know that, no, oh, you said crash course. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was thinking Khan Academy, oh. Never mind. So I can say this, guys, if you're looking for good video supplements, crash course is good, although what's Hank Green talks so stinking fast I can't keep up. Mm -hmm. um, be really leery with Khan Academy you guys know Khan Academy was made by some pretentious dad with a degree in math because he thought that his kids weren't learning enough math in high school, so he made a bunch of videos. It's actually true. Um, and, and they were good. To his credit, he did good work. But then, guys, Khan Academy became a brand, and they started bringing people in to do videos for other disciplines. Have you guys ever watched Khan Academy chemistry videos? None of you have? Yeah, I, I would love to know your opinions, but frankly, I've never found them to be good. The best place for me to go, and this is a great college tip, Bozeman Science. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's actually, there's a high, my, my brother's kids have all had this guy as a teacher. They live in Bozeman, and he's actually a guy that teaches, it's a smaller high school. He teaches AP Chem, AP Physics, and AP Bio. He teaches them all. Um, and he started doing videos, and then the National Science Foundation and the Department of Education hired him away for three or four years to perfect his videos, and now he's back. Bozeman Science is a great place to go. He's actually a teacher and not an angry dad. So, yeah. You guys good on this idea? Yeah. So, Yes. No. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, maybe. Um, yeah, right. No, I have no idea. I, what if I say yes? Would you believe me? Why, yes, Jared, that's exactly what's going on. I have no idea. Um, the thing that is interesting to, sorry, what you said was interesting. The thing that's immediately interesting to me is you're right that intermolecular forces create negative pressure, but it's negative compared to what the pressure would be without the IMFs, right? And so actually in the equation that Pivnert turns into when we quantify um, the intermolecular forces, it's a subtractive portion. It's minus the pressure due to IMFs. So now coming to your idea with negative temperature, now you're talking about temperatures lower than zero in the Kelvin scale. It's a different foundation. So when we say less pressure, we mean less compared to what it would be if they weren't being accounted for. Negative temperature is, a, I think, a whole different reasoning because it's less than none. Um, and then at that point, I don't know what to do with it. So, all right. You guys good? One more to go. 
Say what? Oh my gosh. Yeah, right? All right, so guys, question number two goes like this. So now volume is constant. Temperature goes up. What happens to pressure? How are we going to start our sentence? Restate the constant. At constant volume, an increase in temperature causes the pressure to... <clears throat> and guys, if I may, can I just say this quickly? I don't know if this is you guys, but I've had years where students would answer this question by saying, becomes less negative. What? Yeah, I don't know why, but there was something going on in the math department where they were really stressing this idea that going up is really just the inverse of going down. And all of my students were writing in that verbiage, and it was horrible. Um, so if in your mind you're going to say go up means become less down, don't. <laughs> it was, and I couldn't break them of it. I wanted to go over and beat up the math department, but they're all tougher than I am. <laughs> Miss Shaw, she'll kill you. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? You won't, you'll like it. She will take you out, and at the end of the day, you're going to thank her. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yep. Say what? Uh, well, but you understand the pressures, right? That we can eat and drink in here freely because we don't have carpet. We have had it pounded into us that if you have carpet in your room... <laughs> or at least stress. Tensile strength goes up. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. Looking at our picture. At constant pressure as... What? Oh, my bad. Sorry. Let me... So, thank you. Um, so, at constant vol... Oh, yes. At constant volume. As the temperature goes up, what happens to pressure? So, guys, let's look at our picture. What is not changing in your mental movie? The size of the circle. What is changing in your mental movie? Speed of the particles. And as these particles speed up, what happens to pressure? Goes up. So we say it like this. At constant volume, as the temperature goes up, the pressure increases. This is true because... What's the connection? Increased temperature, increased speed, or you could just go straight to kinetic energy. You wouldn't have to make the link, but at the end of the day, increased kinetic energy, higher force, higher pressure. Is that okay? Okay. Guys, that's where, yeah, please. Yeah, the triple dots? No, they love it. Yeah, no, that, so, no, those are, those are what are called Boolean operators. Um, and no, they love it because it makes you look nerdy. Oh, so the mathematical symbol for therefore is this. Yeah, so use it. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, well, and I can certainly see that for you, Linz, because you think sequentially. You're a logical thinker, right? Yeah, yeah. You guys good? All right. So guys, finally then this, and this goes fast because we frankly talked about it last time. But guys, we just need to talk really briefly about non-ideal behavior. 
We used to have to get into this mathematically, but we don't. But guys, we've already talked about it, so quick review. If you've got an ideal gas, it means the volume of the molecules is insignificant compared to the overall volume, and the intermolecular forces are ineffective because of the spaces around the molecules. So guys, bottom line is this. Why are gases ideal? It's because they're all spread out. That makes the volume of the particles insignificant. That makes the IMFs ineffective. So what can we do to make that not the case? The answer is smushify them. Compress. So guys, finally I put this together the way that it actually should look. If you remember that when I did this um, by dragging last time, I was able to make the circle smaller, but then the particles got proportionally smaller. What it should actually look like is this. Particles of the same size in a smaller container. So now we can clearly see that these dudes are so close together that now all of a sudden the volume of the molecules is not insignificant and they're close together that they get sticky. The intermolecular forces are no longer ineffective. Now guys, the bottom line is this. This is all about density. So low density gases are more ideal, higher density gases are less ideal. So this then is the $11,000 question. What can we do to make gases less ideal? How? So one of the...